Is this on? Yes, it's on. Hi. Wel welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming today to our uh, Castle Lecture Series. Um, I'm Christine Jones, and I have the honor of introducing to you Rick Potts, who's one of the leading paleoanthropologists in the world. Uh, Rick received his doctorate in, no, not, <laughs> in, in biological anthropology from Harvard. Uh, then was on the faculty at Yale, where he was also curator of Yale's Peabody Museum. And then he joined the Smithsonian in 1985. And he is now the director of the Smithsonian Human Origins Program and also the curator of the David H. Koch Hall of Human Origins at Natural History. Um, how many of you guys have seen that exhibition? Has everyone seen it? Absolutely. It's absolutely one of the most incredible and popular exhibitions in this place. And the theme of that hall, as well as the lecture, is what does it mean to be human? So Rick has dedicated um, all, essentially all of his research at Smithsonian toward piecing together the, the record of the Earth's environmental changes and, and human adaptations. Um, very important insights into this research um, are now being gained through core samples of sediments um, that Rick's team recovered from more than 160 meters below the ground at an early human site in the East African Rift Valley in southern Kenya. Um, in particular, this sample, which was just obtained about one year ago, is providing new information on climate change during the last 500,000 years. And was, this work was just featured last month in Science Magazine. So now let me turn this over to Rick. And the title of his talk is what will it mean to be human, imagining our lives in the Anthropocene? Rick, all yours. Let me not take your notes. <laughs> 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 
what a what a thrilling opportunity to um, to address uh, this uh, this group in in this particular place. Six million years ago, an ancestor standing upright began the human venture. From the outset, this venture took place in an era of instability and uncertainty. Although we used to think of uh, East Africa uh, in kind of nurturing terms, the cradle of mankind, for example, it's now understood that it created precarious tests of uh, uncertainty and uh, matters that tested the survival and adaptability of our ancestors. The cauldron of human evolution is more of the phrase that I prefer these days, better reflecting the roiling events and the churning process that define the line between thriving and decline, between survival and extinction in the era of human origins. After several million years, the sole survivor uh, of that radiation of bipedal species is ourselves, Homo sapiens, worldwide in extent. A turning point in the history of life due to our capacity to alter the world. Covering more than 50% of uh, today's land surface, our human-dominated ecosystems where the flow of energy is largely geared toward human needs. And when you add up the total area that humans uh, occupy or alter or pollute or destroy, according to some people's reckoning, uh, the total comes to some, about 83% of Earth's viable land surface. When you add in then the effects on the ocean and atmosphere, the picture of, uh, of our species' pervasive in impact becomes quite complete. I, uh, I haven't brought any PowerPoint slides with me today, which is an odd thing for me. <laughs> uh, but I have brought with me um, some of the, well, the oldest implements in the Smithsonian collections. Um, these were made by human ancestors about two million years ago. Uh, they're simple things, and um, they're just chipped along the edge in a, in a, in a pattern. Uh, and although they are simple things, they mark our species' uh, oldest uh, ability to alter and rearrange the, uh, the surroundings. Uh, this particular chip stone, which comes from one of our excavations in East Africa, was carried eight miles away from the place where this rock, this rock originally was found. Uh, and it was taken to a place where uh, antelopes and uh, young zebra were butchered and their bones broken open for nutritious bone marrow. And also a place where tubers and roots were dug up from uh, under the ground. And then when you add in things like like this hammer stone and sharp flakes, we have a very simple but complete early uh, toolkit. And with this ancient and most basic uh, set of altered stones, all of the food resources uh, of the African grasslands and woodlands uh, became accessible. With this hammer stone, you, uh, you could crush more effectively than an elephant's molar. And with this sharp stone flake, you could cut more efficiently than a lion's canine tooth or whittle a stick uh, to dig with greater yield uh, than a warthog's tusk to get uh, roots and tubers out of the ground. Uh, and in fact, any food that could be eaten uh, by a large omnivorous mammal uh, could be obtained with these simple modifications of the environment. Now, this early ability, in fact, the earliest ability uh, to alter things took place during a time of strong fluctuation in East African climates and landscapes. The adaptability afforded uh, by this set of strange behaviors I've just described to you, chipping stones and carrying rocks, taking rocks from one place on the landscape to another, proved to be of such survival value in this ever-shifting era that technology stuck around. And it stayed around and, and developed in us, and it has become part of the foundation of human life. These uh, first two, well, I should say the first two-thirds of uh, our evolutionary history were exclusively in Africa. And shortly 
after two million years ago, our genus, the genus Homo, which is African in origin, began to spread to new places, taking with it its ability to modify things. With the species Homo erectus, the ability to explore and to disperse uh, to new places enabled it to endure. And in fact, um, the, uh, the species Homo erectus survived about nine times longer than our own species has been on Earth so far. And from erectus, we uh, inherited a propensity to explore and to colonize. Yet much of what is distinctive uh, of our own species evolved later during the past one million years, attaining a, uh, an especially large brain relative to our uh, body size, controlling fire and making shelters uh, that defined a central place on the landscape where the social group could, uh, could return, uh, basically return home in a way that's familiar to uh, everyone living on Earth today prolonging the pace of growing up, of growth, with enormous implications for the uh, energy and time and care that we need to give to our offspring, and for learning and the capacity for culture. All of these were developments of the past one million years. By 300,000 years ago, as documented in our most recent excavations in the uh, the Kenya Rift Valley, we see the first obvious clues that a transition had occurred toward innovation. We see new toolkits that included projectiles, sharp projectiles, uh, pigments that could be used for uh, coloring, emblematic of the increasing complexity uh, of um, the use of symbols and language. The development of social networks and the exchange of resources uh, among uh, groups that were uh, that lived far apart from one another, and eventually the diversification of cultures, which multiplied the options of our species, diverse expressions of what it means to be human. These aspects of our heritage also arose in a dynamic and unpredictable world. On a global scale, the the past six million years. Uh, have comprised one of the most dramatic periods of climatic oscillation and en environmental instability of the Cenozoic era around the past 65 million years. Every paleoclimate and paleoenvironmental record studied over the past 40 years has, has two trends uh, to it, the, um, or two signals to it, the overall trend and the amplitude of, uh, of variability. Up till about 20 years ago, uh, essentially every student of uh, human evolution considered the variability simply as noise in the all-important trend toward a drier and a cooler Earth. Uh, the development of the savanna grasslands of Africa, for example, or the development and the onset of uh, glacial conditions in northern latitudes. The direction of climate change, the onset of a particular ancestral habitat was thought to be the key signal that elicited the development of uniquely human adaptations. And yet all of those dozen, uh, dozens of environmental records show evidence of dramatic instability between wet and arid, between cool and warm. And as a result, variability and uncertainty have become the new theme in the environmental story of human origins. The overarching narrative of human evolution has therefore changed a great deal. It has changed from a story of how the human lineage came to have dominion over a particular ancestral environment to a story of evolving adaptability and the persistent change in the uh, conditions of survival. And so quite a number of conclusions can be drawn from these new perspectives on human origins. During the era of human evolution, the natural world had no enduring stable baseline. Over the past several million years, high rates of extinction have occurred in most groups of vertebrates. And this is true even of our own evolutionary group, the one to which we belong. Out of a minimum of 18 different species of evolutionary ancestors and cousins, only one lineage, of course, our species, has survived, and all the other ways of life of earlier hominins have gone extinct, even though each species 
possessed at least some of the unique distinguishing characteristics of human life. The difference between humans today and those extinct immediate relatives of ours, immediate in the evolutionary sense, is that our basic adaptations rely heavily upon the ability to alter the surroundings. This is our mode of survival. Homo sapiens, our species, possesses through its natural evolutionary heritage an extraordinary ability to modify landscapes, the distribution of food and water and other resources. And interestingly, and most importantly, a, an extraordinary capacity to alter ourselves, a proclivity to alter our ways of life, our systems of belief, our transactions with one another, and of course this is responsible for the amazing behavioral diversity of our species, our cultural diversity. And so from the standpoint of human origins, the starting point in thinking about the Anthropocene is that we live in the world by altering it. This is a function of our basic adaptations, enabling us to buffer uncertainty and instability by changing how the world is. So even from simple interactions with the environment, like this two million year old stone tool, or a stone hand ax, or moving resources across the landscape, creating fire, building shelters, planting uh, or tending to a plant in order to secure the food supply, all of these very basic elements of survival ended up changing the immediate surroundings. This way of life became so successful that it spread worldwide. And so to conclude this, what I'll call first chapter of this, of this talk, which is focused on human origins, our fundamentally human social, ecological, and behavioral adaptations have over time ratcheted up the adaptability of our species, our ability to manage the immediate world, to cushion the unpredictable, to survive no novelty all through an extraordinary ability to alter the surroundings. And now we find ourselves where the planetary scale of human impact is unquestionable. And the second chapter of, this, of the talk will speak more directly to the idea of the, anthro uh, the Anthropocene, or Anthropocene if you prefer that pronunciation. Uh, decreased biodiversity, uh, revised biogeochemical cycles and novel combinations of climate and ecological conditions arise from the existence of people everywhere. One of the impressive statistics that I know some of you have heard me cite before is that about six times more water is controlled by dams or in man-made lakes than occurs as free-flowing water over the continents. With regard to the atmosphere, uh, despite differences in opinion over the exact uh, future of rising CO2, what seems to me to get lost in the noise of the manufactured uh, debate is that even the most conservative estimates of sea level rise uh, inundate, eventually inundate, areas um, occupied by about 10% of the human population. And given the sharp rise of, uh, of population, uh, in our lifetimes, the implications of 700 to 900 million people displaced or requiring new livelihoods have hardly been imagined. And for these reasons, the Anthropocene concept has largely gained traction due to the, uh, the potential harm uh, that people cause. There is justifiable hand-wringing about the unplanned effects, the unintended consequences of human activity, what we might think of as the downstream effects of human decisions, wastes, and emissions, and self-interest in the use of land and resources that underpin livelihoods and personal uh, security and comforts. And taking a, a different approach, I've begun to imagine over the past about the past year, although my thinking on this goes back to a book that was published in 1996, um, what would it be like to have a different starting point in the discussions uh, about this age of humans? One where we envision intended and purposeful consequences. What will it take to shape a world that is positive, meaningful, and beneficial 
to life in general and to human well-being. And so let me tell you a, a story, a story that I've experienced in East Africa. There is a, uh, a young man who lives where I work in the, uh, in the East African Rift. And he's the son of a very old man who owns land bordering a river uh, that is dry most of the year, except for when it rains during the rainy season. And over the last several years, this young man has decided to cut trees in places where his father can no longer reach, can no longer visit, and perhaps give advice. And this includes all the trees along the river, uh, the trees that hold up the riverbank. He's denuded the riverbank. The people of the community have a, a great depth of knowledge about landscapes, uh, the care of livestock, and uh, responsible nurturing of the environment and also wildlife. And yet the decision of this young man to burn trees, to make charcoal, and to, for personal gain, make money uh, by selling uh, the charcoal as fuel are, during the rains, causing the loose silt from the riverbank to erode and wash downstream. The sediment is, in fact, filling the livestock watering holes that are used and managed by the entire community. And soon it's thought the managed pools will be filled up, they'll be gone. And so will the availability of water for cattle and livestock. And literally, we might think of this as a downstream effect. The, everyone in the community knows this man, and they know of the impact of his supposedly hidden enterprise. But they have no idea what to do. They ask, shouldn't a person have the rights to what is his? Um, with his land and with his trees. This is a problem of the Anthropocene. This story underlines the fact that this young man's decisions are part of the community. In a sense, they belong to the community. His actions have connected him with all of his neighbors because everyone owns cattle and has a collective interest in the well-being of the environment and the availability of water throughout the year. Well, it strikes me that this story illustrates a principle of the human altered world at its foundation an ethical matter of mindfulness of how intimately connected we all are. And so I've come to see the Anthropocene not as a debate about a geological era, but as a way of thinking, a way of thinking about our identity and what will it mean to be human in the future. And so our thought experiment uh, here today, uh, I'd like to focus uh, less on um, specific problems and less on piecemeal solutions to the harm that people may induce, and more on the principles that may be able to um, guide us and guide meaningful pathways as we continue to alter the world and ourselves. Critical to imagining life in the Anthropocene is the importance of narrative in continually shape, reshaping ourselves. Our evolutionary history, as you can imagine, I would say, is important in this regard. The ongoing revision of that uh, narrative shows that we and our altering tendencies are embedded in a very dynamic natural world and are uh, fully interconnected with it. I think that revising this entwined human and nature narrative to reflect this is essential in how we will uh, shape the future. Cultural diversity. Cultural diversity is obviously very important in itself, but also as a reservoir of human knowledge and ways of life. And this diversity represents the expanded options of our species, expanded options of human behavior and resilience and adaptations to the, to the environment and to one another. And thus, from an evolutionary perspective, maintaining these options is of incredible value. Yet it's also valuable to embed our heterogeneity in an ethic and a narrative of common purpose, uh, what we might call a narrative of one humanity, expressed locally, of course, in different ways. There is much to appreciate in a single origin that nurtures human identity as a species. The effect of a planetary one humanity narrative is to foster a sense of collective identity 
the value of collective well-being and I think a sense of shared responsibility for that well-being. The positive paths that we create in this age of humans certainly will not be done through a total consensus. That, in fact, would not be human of us at all. Uh, yet in seeking meaningful futures, people must feel included in the, in the community and national and global conversations that must occur. And I think that inclusion can enable people to listen to one another, to reflect and act coherently, even if actions are an expression of our diversity. We need to get over our mourning for an ancient concept of nature as pristine, eternal, if only people would leave it alone. This idea defines nature as something that exists beyond where people live and thus is now <clears throat> largely invisible and inaccessible and irrelevant to most people. Such an unchanging original uh, view of the natural world is a misreading of nature and it draws from the mistaken assumption that humans are separate from it by special dominion and mastery of the environment. This old myth offers none of the insights and understandings on which human lives depend as part of physical and biotic systems across the planet. One of the most important principles, I think, for us to uh, consider, think about, is the concept, uh, concept of resilience or adaptability, which is a very dynamic process. It means the capacity to adjust in an evolutionary sense and through, to adjust by processes of change culturally, psychologically, as well as biologically. And I think it's critical to distinguish between the concept of resilience and the concept of sustainability, which also has gained a lot of traction in discussions in the era of humans. In defining what we want the world to be, I think we would all prefer to say something like, we'd like to sustain the world that's familiar to us. That what's valuable to us is the world as we see it. And yet an intended future uh, needs to be defined in far more, I don't want to say volatile, but, dy but dynamic and ever-changing terms. And each decade, I think, will comprise a, a newly altered world where understandings and hopes uh, defined by future generations will be framed in new ways, ways that we can't even begin to see. Every gen generation will live in a new Anthropocene. And much as we who came of age and grew up in the 1960s and 70s uh, built our lives around new, to some people's thinking, radical assumptions regarding personal liberties and equalities uh, that were troubling to some members of previous generations, so we should be mindful uh, to find inspiration and celebration rather than threat as future generations experiment and define new express expectations built on the principle of resilience uh, rather than on a desire to preserve the powerful pull of the world as we see it and demand its preservation. Certain definitions of sustainability are simply uh, too static, seeking to stabilize what already exists and to preserve the status quo. World climate and non-human systems are in themselves highly unpredictable, and human activities will certainly add greatly to the unpredictable effects in ways that will challenge our adaptability. And this, as if you recall, the first part of this talk is one of the deep time principles of human origins that will continue. I think it's a good idea not to bet against the challenges to our adaptability that will take place in the future. One of the realities of the Anthropocene is that human decisions about the surroundings are, I think, largely based on people's satisfaction. Satisfaction about uh, green spaces and parks and conservancies uh, created by and for people uh, and places of solitude that pay uh, no heed to a biodiversity baseline. And whether one judges this in terms of our own experiences as good or bad, human management and construction of nature uh, is a reality of the Anthropocene. We can certainly agree that every person has some stake uh, in the health, abundance, and transformations of the world around us. 
planning for purposeful and beneficial outcomes will need to be in touch with the realities, some might say, might say unfortunate realities, of human alteration of the environment, including mismanagement, species loss, and the miseries inherent in a whole range of human uh, impulses and conflicts. And so when it comes to building principles for living uh, in the Anthropocene, there is certainly a need for people to become morally aroused and activated with a deep sense of personal responsibility uh, that will stretch us beyond self-interest. So there are certain qualities that I would like to suggest that should contribute and that may contribute importantly to a moral stance in the Anthropocene. Let me try some of these concepts out on you just as words. Uh, universality, inclusion, empathy, reciprocity, humility, connectedness with something larger than ourselves, our embeddedness uh, in nature, and a union of what's sometimes called anthropocentric and biocentric thinking, that is thinking that does, that focuses on human well-being as well as non-human well-being. There are many more qualities that I'm sure you're thinking about, that I've thought about, and their discussion would take a, a very long time. Yet I'm convinced that such qualities must become part of the shared social project of our new era. Inclusion is the right for people to participate in decisions about their future, which is linked to, to, uh, to justice. Humility is the opposite of certain senses of the word dominion. Embeddedness in nature is seeing ourselves as evolved as part of nature rather than separated from it. Empathy and reciprocity arise from taking the perspective of other people. Critical to raising resilience and thus to life in the Anthropocene is what I call a, the, the moral responsibility dilemma. And this is an idea that I've been trying to work out over the last uh, several weeks. And it, it arises from the fact that humans are a global phenomenon and we're concentrated in denser and denser populations. This moral responsibility dilemma goes something like this. In a situation where people <coughs> perceive that self-restraint is important in using a particular resource, in solving a particular environmental problem, Yet at the same time, it's also perceived that others, others in your community, others, other nations, for example, do not share a similar belief or commitment. What then develops is a sense of unequal moral investment in the issues. And when that occurs, personal responsibility goes out the window, or it can go out the window, and no restraint and uh, no solutions are found. Solving this, this, uh, this dilemma, this problem, and its impact on the psychology of, uh, of human action, I think will be a major project of the Anthropocene. I believe it will be impossible to make progress on uh, this dilemma without a planetary and one species narrative, reminding us that we're all in it together in terms of solving the problems of resilience and responsibility. And so in this third and final chapter of this talk um, concerns imagining what the Anthropocene will be like here in the Smithsonian. And this new era is certainly full of interdisciplinary promise and concern. And each area across the sciences, history, arts, culture can be indispensable in framing and exemplifying both personal and public responsibilities on a future human-constructed planet. The Anthropocene, like other eras of human evolution, will be a time of making mistakes, errors that arise from a lack of knowledge and understanding about how the world works. And there is so much that we do not have a handle on regarding the resilience of ecosystems, the interconnected resilience of organisms and human economies, and there's a heck of a lot that we don't know about the impact of well-intentioned human actions in trying to build resilience and benefits for the future. And so the Anthropocene will require vast new pools of knowledge about the interconnected human and non-human world. 
The question that I've asked myself over the last several months is how we at the Smithsonian might reimagine our activities pertaining to the uncertainties ahead, of course, in ways uh, that's, that are consistent with our mission and our service. The mandate to increase and uh, communicate knowledge effectively implies that our mission should matter. In light of our increasingly human-shaped planet, the meaningful increase in diffusion uh, might well include uh, a new uh, seeking to connect um, people, to, to imagine with us, and to envision uh, a purposeful and satisfying future. Every month, I've, in fact, I think every, every week, we can see discoveries and public engagement, whether it's in the, the Sackler, at the zoo, in and around the mall or beyond the mall, that can be framed as relevant to this task. In an exhibit that I think ended early last year at American Art, the exhibition titled The Great American Hall of Wonders, we saw a, a celebration of, of innovation. But more than that, I was affected by the, the paintings of the meeting of bison and railroad workers, and by loggers dwarfed by giant redwood trees, and the display of an Edison light bulb. And all of these tell stories about the roots of the Anthropocene and the potential to connect those stories about our past with what we may wish the future to be. In natural history, in last month's announcement of the new carnivoran species Olingito, there is an opportunity, I think, to appreciate rarity, something precious, and also the daring to search in the cloud forests of the, uh, of the Andes. This also can be framed as an Anthropocene story. The ongoing project at the Smithsonian in uh, 3D digitization, you might wonder how in the world could that be connected with what we're talking about. Well, I think that it raises awareness of the care that we give, the act of rendering things without touching them. The project draws attention to the fragility of so many things, from fossil bones to uh, orchids to works of art and really across the continuous spectrum from non-human to human. This work, in my mind, is a, a metaphor for how it's possible to do good even as we increasingly uh, engage in our surroundings, including the natural world, including our own nature and the things that we make and alter. And so I think that there are a lot of examples here at the Smithsonian that afford an extraordinary range of opportunities for us to connect the public, national public and international public, to these issues and challenges of the future. But they will be missed opportunities if we fail to pay attention to the ways in which people will need to engage in the challenging future. And so I, I urge us to begin to imagine how our areas, our skills, and our expertise can entice our audiences to imagine with us, to move forward or toward an era of intended consequences, a world that we create on purpose. In the light of the accelerated uncertainties in society, environment, cultures, biology, human meaning, challenges that define the new thin line between thriving and decline, it seems to me that it's inappropriate to rest on our laurels as a tourist destination. There is much more at stake than this. Positive paths can, I believe, better be explored through engaging and starting a national conversation, in fact, a global dialogue that perhaps the Smithsonian is uniquely capable of leading, if there's a will to do so. Imagining a future of accidental harm that involves rising seas that rupture a, a tenth of humanity or storms and droughts that displace while we wonder whether a 10% cut will prevent us from going to a conference or even from finishing a building. That just seems to be a future that's a little bit wrong-headed to me. It's a future that shouldn't be an option for us. And so if there is a will, can we work with those who govern so that we could perhaps lead this conversation without fear of disapproval? Can we leave the familiarity of our offices in Washington, D.C.? 
uh, to converse with people no matter where they live so that the problems of this new era can graduate from the theor theoretical discussed inside a room to the realities and practicalities of people's lives. And this same question about how we can lead goes for our sister institutions where scientists and students of the humanities, educators, economists, thinkers in all realms of knowledge have the potential to add to our understanding of this new era and its well-being. The question then is, what will it mean to be human in the Anthropocene? And I think the key phrase is, what will it mean? Because meaningfulness is the centerpiece of at least one of the answers. As a brainy, technological, highly symbolic biped, our instinct is the drive to find meaningful ties with one another and meaningful ties with our surroundings. And inevitably, we take our cues from learning or by learning from one another. Our mission to discover, to analyze, and develop explanations is certainly important in building solid responses uh, to the challenges of future uncertainty. And so it hardly needs to be stated, but it's imperative that we continue to generate trustworthy scientific information and explanations. At the same time, we must also very deeply realize that trust has very deep societal and psychological dimensions. And because people's decisions and their perceptions are filtered through worldviews and attitudes and well-defended emotional positions, it will take more than scientific evidence and information to build beneficial future consequences. Actively creating a meaningful future must become a, as I think I referred to it before, a shared social project, one in which our connectivity, morals, and embeddedness in nature, held within the vessels of art and historical and cultural narrative, begin to write a resonant story that builds a foundation for new perceptions, understandings, and actions. And this is why I thought that spending some time with you today to, would be worthwhile to imagine some of the principles, perhaps general principles, but principles nonetheless of living in the Anthropocene. I think that these principles will be absolutely essential in shaping a meaningful world, starting this conversation among ourselves, but more importantly with, uh, with others is something that's, I think, really big. And it's important, and it's going to be difficult and perhaps a little humbling. And yet, by thinking and working together, this grand social project can move ahead. Thanks very much. very much. And uh, Rick is willing to answer some uh, questions. Questions from any of you of how we uh, best proceed with this great new dream experiment? Yep. yep. Brian, yes. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> I've been asked to repeat the question, which will give me time to avoid the question. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. The question was that I've struck an optimistic chord, yet given the, uh, the current political uh, climate and also the, uh, the strife that occurs around the world, um, what would be some examples or the basis for my optimism? Uh, Brian also mentioned <laughs> 
my, uh, my expertise in human evolution. I'm not quite sure my expertise in human evolution provides particular answers except the, again, general principles of adaptability and resilience. Unfortunately, also one of the uh, general principles of human evolution is that we're the last remaining species of a clade that's largely been extinct. Um, there are a lot of uh, versions of being human um, that uh, have succumbed to, uh, to, to, to threat. And I don't wish to overblow um, the current situation, but I don't think the current situation in our species with such enormous conflict and strife can be overblown. And I think that we need to, um, to confront some of these realities. My optimism is, is based on um, not so much my experience in the investigation of human origins, but in my experience with uh, discussing human origins with people who would never, ever um, take to the subject. And that the idea of a conversation and starting a, a dialogue um, has proved extremely important because it involves these elements of inclusiveness in a conversation or bringing up difficult matters that shouldn't be avoided in this case with regard to an understanding of human evolution, things concerning uh, public science education. Those may be small potatoes compared with what I'm talking about here, but it's a small model that is uh, responsible for my larger model of uh, perhaps something akin to diplomacy, but more than diplomacy, conversation by people who, who care and matter who can be found in every community in every, every country uh, across the globe. And I think that unless we, we try, that um, the, uh, the, the challenging future uh, and the uncertainties of it will um, make more of us succumb to it than uh, succeed in it. Again, that's a very general answer, but that's what I have right at the moment. Yeah, yeah sure. The, the question is, uh, is there, are there any examples in um, our, uh, our cous evolutionary cousins and ancestors of earlier human species um, that suggest that they may have met their demise due to uh, overpopulation? And the answer is decidedly there are no examples of that. Um, in fact, actually, what we see in the um, study of the extinction of earlier hominins uh, is um, that um, it's really the dwindling of populations like it is for every other organism. Um, the restriction in the amount of area that they covered, the restriction in the evolutionary possibilities that they had, the options of foods that they could eat, of the kinds of tools that they could make, um, the size of their of their of their brains when they were when there was one species that um, survived and another species that went extinct. Um, those that were uh, had invested more in um, complex ways of doing things in the world and of interacting with the sur surroundings, having a broader diet, having a broader geographic range that was spread out rather than densely concentrated. Those were the species that survived. And this is one of the reasons why I say maintaining the options of our species, the diversity of ways of being human is very important because that certainly was a, a very strong advantage that Homo sapiens had during a time of really radical change in African environments uh, and enabled adaptability of our species, survival and, and eventually eventual spread while the Neanderthals, for example, who, were, who coexisted on Earth at that time, um, didn't have such diversity and were much more specialized in their environmental adaptations to a, a cold environment. And so again, every time I look at these matters and trying to explain extinction, we come up upon this idea that this, these notions of adaptability and resilience and maintaining options are critical. But a demise due to uh, large concentrations of population, no, we have no examples of that. We 
could be the first. write that down. Um, the, the, the question is, where do we begin? Where do we begin with this uh, conversation about and these uh, passing on of, of, uh, of qualities uh, with regard to a, uh, a more productive and beneficial uh, human future? Do we start with uh, individuals? Do we start with a what was it, a committee of good feelings? No, it wasn't that. Um, uh, in any case, where, where do we begin? It's a good question. I, in my own personal view is you start with, with people, with individuals. You start with uh, um, trying to strike a chord um, with um, everyone on Earth who makes a decision, which is, which is everyone. Now, how do you reach that? And it's got to be networked in some ways. Um, there are tools that we have in the modern day in the Anthropocene that uh, allow us to do that, but nothing replaces face-to-face -face contact. Uh, nothing replaces having a conversation. Nothing replaces what I call sh just showing up uh, to, uh, to talk about these things. Um, but it's hard, and I haven't really quite worked out in my own head yet, how do you, how do you get people to come to a meeting? <laughs> how do you get people to, to discuss uh, with you? And so much of it in this day and age, as promulgated by, uh, by, by television and other, and other media who are our friends, but also there is this matter of creating an urgency about every single thing that happens, so that everything seems urgent. Whereas what we're talking about are matters of the future that really require long-term thinking. Uh, rather than the, the, the short-term benefits, uh, what should I do in the next hour? <laughs> By the way, thanks for coming. Um, uh, and, um, I, and so it, it's, it's difficult to figure that out. A, a committee, um, I'm not so sure about that unless it's a committee of people who are committed to holding these sorts of uh, community and national conversations with real people. Yes, Johnny. Yeah, the, uh, the, the question is, um, in, among all the different things that one can put your fing our fingers on, that um, the rate of population expansion seems to be the root of a lot of the, um, uh, the troubling um, unintended consequences of the Anthropocene, and um, what do we do about that? Um, and we is not meant to be the Smithsonian, but what as a, as a species we, we, we do about that? Um, again, all I can do is maybe tell a little bit of a, of a parable of what's, what I've seen, for example, in Kenya, which uh, is, uh, or was, as of 20 years ago, the African country with the uh, fastest rate of um, completed fertility, uh, the highest completed fertility and, and fastest rate of population increase. And the, uh, the, the guys who, uh, who work with me in excavation, um, throughout the rest of the year, they're farmers. They work on their on their land, uh, tilling the soil, and then for two to three months out of the year, they come and dig the soil with us. Um, and um, and I've had a lot of opportunities for conversations with them. And 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, um, all of them said, "Yeah, well, I I have eight children. I have 11 children. I have you know six children, and I'm still a young person." Um, and what you see now is that through their own observations, family observations of the uh, complex dynamic between land, which is inheritance, and um, the number of people and education, which costs, as actually being a buffer against times when people have died due to starvation in times of drought, that I talk with uh, 
the next generation of people who have come to work with, with me, um, who are uh, in their um, uh, late 20s or, or 30s. And um, I have one ch child. I have two. I have three ch children. And if they say they have three children, then they're really looking for an advance on their salaries for school fees. <laughs> and they've understood this, this equation. Um, people have a way of working this out in, within realms of self-benefit, um, self really. Um, the question is whether that's going to be enough. And I think that a lot of what has occurred um, in Kenya is discussion, discussion about matters of population control, birth control, um, that uh, actually has infiltrated um, the, uh, the minds and the thinking of people so that that becomes part of the equation in working these, these matters out. I don't see any other way around it right at this point. Yes, please. Yeah, do I, I think that it would benefit the conversation to um, note and to inculcate in, in people's minds the idea that it's going to take more than one generation to find solutions. Uh, yes, the answer to that is, is yes. The, uh, uh, Dr. Clough himself has uh, been talking a lot about uh, thinking in long terms. Of course, long terms there is one I appreciate in terms of 10,000 years, such as in the Long Now Foundation. I think a little bit longer than that, actually. But, um, but we obviously, um, thousands of years are comprised of months and individual years. And we need to be able to begin to find solutions in, in that kind of uh, uh, time frame. But uh, yes, we need to, to uh, I think it would be very important to be able to tell a narrative about ourselves and about um, our relationship with the world and with one another. That includes, uh, from a very young age, understanding that um, solutions to matters uh, requires long-term uh, thinking. Um, and, um, you know, whether, um, how people then um, take that into account, long-term thinking in relationship to what am I going to do over the next hour, um, is uh, there are going to be a whole variety of different responses to that. It's part of the uncertainties of the future. Yes, Kirk. In thinking that way, though, the challenge the Anthropocene has really risen in the last 10 generations. So to be able to explain this human history, we really have a problem on our hands that we've got a very recent origin. So it seems that uh, the same thing is going to happen in some way that solution. Yeah, the, uh, Kirk's question was that given that the problems of the Anthropocene are largely ones of the last 10 generations, um, that um, these are, it's, it's hard necessarily to have formulated and to figure out what these uh, longer term solutions might be and how those might uh, play out. I can only say that I, uh, I agree with that. Um, one of the remarkable things, though, about um, human behavior. Uh, looking at it from the standpoint of an anthropologist is the extraordinary uh, rapidity with which people can differentiate themselves from a prior position. And, and so the solution may be right. Okay, I see your point that the solution may be, may be quite faster than the, the development of the problem. And I think that that's true. That if you look at, say, uh, even in the time frame of hundreds of years, um, certainly a couple of thousand years, um, the development of the immense diversity of languages and systems of thinking on the island of New Guinea, um, they, where people differentiate themselves as having a different view from one another, uh, while that um, has been actually a source of conflict, that it's possible to, I think, to uh, frame uh, that tendency uh, for human solution finding and for um, trying out a variety of scenarios that may work for the future, um, that there is some optimism in that speed at which the human mind works. Yes, please, yeah.
Right. The, uh, the, the question um, was about uh, space exploration and the uh, concept of a, uh, uh, how that may link into a concept of a collective and um, solutions for the future. And um, uh, you're, you're reading my mind of a part of the talk I had to slice, uh, which is the part of the talk where I spoke about that inclination to explore. Uh, and to uh, go to, uh, to different places, and that that is, in fact, from a, a long-term uh, human evolutionary perspective, part of the foundation of, uh, of survival of hominin species over long periods of time. And so I think that um, in addition to the various things that I mentioned uh, regarding uh, cultural diversity and how we tell ourselves the history of our species, uh, and uh, matters of uh, biological diversity, that matters of space and space exploration uh, will uh, also be a viable uh, thing that we may need to, uh, to look at. Um, people have asked me, especially science fiction writers, to uh, imagine, well, what's that going to do to us in our evolutionary history? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but um, one of the things that it could do is that it, it could create a greater sense of separation from people and less of a sense of a one species narrative. Um, and so I think that in along with the impetus to go into space is important to have a collective sense of our species and where we are going, that the long-term uh, colonization of space will provide its own interesting challenges as to the diversification of what it means to be human. Yes, please. Right, yeah, the, the question was about um, the matters of adaptability and the adaptability in our species. Um, but talk, I, the, the question was for me to speak a little bit about the adaptability of other organisms. And is that in a place in a variety of different organisms that will uh, enable them to take on the ravages of the Anthropocene and the uncertainties of it, particularly given changes in environment, given uh, global warming and so on. The adaptability of species is highly varied. Um, the vast majority of species on Earth um, evolved through a process that Darwin defined through natural selection, which involved habitat-specific um, advantages. Um, the uh, evolution and, in a sense, the making of specific um, niches and ways of, ways of life. And how those organisms maintain their adaptability is largely by the ability to disperse. Trees disperse pollen. Animals move across the landscape. And one of the great difficulties in terms of that style of adaptability surviving uh, the Anthropocene is that we build fences, we build highways, we build barriers. Uh, to movement. When we think about uh, creating a place for biodiversity, we think of it as these islands, parks, and reserves that don't necessarily have corridors. And I know that there's been a lot of discussion about that and the need for corridors of, of, of movement, because that's the way in which the adaptability of most organisms is able to be expressed. And so that will need to be an ongoing um, process. Uh, in the Anthropocene of being able to figure out how to develop such uh, corridors of, of uh, movement. Um, but species also have a variety of other ways of adaptability. Um, for example, um, the um, genetic variation that occurs within gene pools, providing the possibility of evolvability of, uh, of different organisms. Um, but um, I think that with regard to matters of biodiversity, um, we're going to see, and we already know this, we, we've already seen and we're going to see um, a large species loss. Um, that species that, have, that are specific to habitats, um, we're not going to be able to accommodate it as we construct nature as we want it. And, um, for better or for worse, certainly for worse from our standpoint of the, of the present, 
um, that I think is going to be a reality of the Anthropocene. Just uh, two short announcements. First, that there are more Castle Lectures coming up in the future. On October 30th, Tim Johnson will be here, and Andrew Johnson will be here on uh, November 19th, and Christine France will be here uh, on, in the middle of December, December 17th. Also this afternoon, there's a consortia open house downstairs, rooms 104, 105, behind the guard desk there. You are all invited for a good conversation, good food, and some beautiful images of the sun. Uh, so please stop by between two and five. Thanks for everybody. <laughs>